Uh, nice to see such a great turnout again. Uh, it's always encouraging to come here and be among uh, people interested in, in natural history and the environment. And I've, I have been uh, to the conference every year, and uh, it's, it's always a great um, learning experience. I learn a lot. It's a, um, an, always an esteemed uh, group of, of scientists and experts. And I just want to thank the, um, the organizers for putting this on. Again, another great job. And thanks for lowering your, your standards occasionally to allow uh, lawyers like me to come up and, and be a part of this. So. Um, so I have a nice follow-up to Chart's presentation. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of history on some of the work that's been done on Long Island to try to restore some of the fish that he mentioned. And uh, even more importantly, talk about some, some of the work we want to do, where we want to go uh, over the next 10 years. So uh, where am I here? I'd like to start with this uh, really beautiful digital elevation map that uh, Brett Bennington at Hofstra produced. Uh, and as you, you sort of, I think more than anything, gives you an idea of, uh, of how many tributaries there are and, and you know, this legacy of ours of this sort of glacial history here in Long Island. These, these channels originally uh, carved out by meltwater running off the glaciers and across the outwash plain. Um, when the ocean was much further out, of course, but as the groundwater has filled up, uh, where the groundwater meets these tributaries, as Chart mentioned, uh, where the groundwater meets these channels and these old historic valleys is where our tributaries exist. Um, and we're left with these uh, beautiful, uh, mostly small, uh, groundwater-fed streams and uh, they're obviously a, a very important part of the, of the terrestrial landscape and really the, the great diversity of habitats across Long Island. But for our purposes here today, they're, also, they're really this connection, this really vital connection uh, between the ocean and the marine habitats and, and upland habitats. And this takes us to our Greek lesson for the day. Um, an important part of that connection are the, are the fish that move between these habitats. So this word is a, a Greek word, diadromis. Uh, the root of this word it means running, and the prefix is through. So these are fish that run between habitats. They split their life cycles between saltwater and freshwater. Uh, a very unique category of fish. Generally, you take a saltwater fish and put it in freshwater, it doesn't do so well, in a, and vice versa. But these fish effortlessly move back and forth uh, evolved along the coast to take advantage of uh, freshwater habitat. Um, we have some bigger diadromous fish offshore, like striped bass and um, Atlantic sturgeon, but they're not found in our streams. Our streams are too small for them. But our diadromous fish, are, we, have, we have three, uh, well, four really. One, one is, is sort of divided into two. This is the first river herring. Uh, chart mentioned there's two species of river herring. One is the alewife, the other is the blueback herring. Um, they're very difficult to distinguish in the field for non-experts uh, and uh, for our, our intents. You know, they are, they share, there are some differences. They have slightly different offshore habitats. Uh, they prefer slightly different uh, spawning habitats in the streams. But when we run our surveys and things, we generally tell our volunteers to sort of treat them uh, as one, as sort of river herring, because they're so hard to tell apart. That said, most of the runs we know of on Long Island are alewife, um, but there is increasing evidence that both of these species uh, historically were here. Uh, the other, and I should, should back up and say, the um, river herring are anadromous, so they spend most of their lives in the ocean and run into freshwater to spawn. Uh, the, the other variety of, of diadromous fish is catadromous fish. These are fish that spend most of their lives in freshwater and migrate out to the ocean to spawn. And the American eel is the only uh, catadromous fish we have on Long Island. And if you don't know, this is an amazing story worthy of its own presentation. But these fish all hatch in the middle of the North Atlantic in a place called the Sargasso Sea. They, they migrate uh, on, on ocean currents for a year, find their way into uh, estuaries, and then swim up uh, into the tributaries where they spend the rest of their lives, 30 or 40 years, uh, grow from tiny little glass eels to uh, four or five feet long before they finally sexually mature and move back out to the ocean in their final migration uh, they go back out to the, to the Sargasso Sea and spawn and die and uh, repeat the cycle. Uh, 
Um, I'll talk, touch on these again later. Uh, and then finally, uh, chart mentioned brook trout. Um, these are what are considered semi-diadromous fish. They're not, uh, they're not um, obligate migrants. They don't need to go out to salt water, but they're capable of doing it. And so they, even though they, they hatch and spend most of their lives in fresh water, they're capable of moving out into the estuary to feed. And part of that story is, is um, tied to the history of Long Island, especially the South Shore and these sportsmen's clubs. Why rich New Yorkers were coming out to Long Island to go fishing was partly because the brook trout were big, and they were big because they were sea-run brook trout. They were salters. They were going out to the bay, um, getting big and coming back in. If Daniel Webster was catching a 14-pound brook trout, in the mill, it doesn't make sense that they were, he was in the mill pond because if he was in the mill pond, likely it was 14 pounds, it was probably a sea run fish. And if it was a sea run fish, it wasn't in the mill pond. So I have, a, I have questions with that whole lithograph. Um, none of these fish are jumpers, uh, and um, they're not capable of getting over the dams we've built all over the island. Um, Dr. Tanacredi mentioned. Uh, the impacts of infrastructure on horseshoe crabs and other species. These diadromous fish are the poster ch child for impacts of infrastructure. They cannot uh, navigate past these structures. So we've built a lot of them uh, for the purposes of those fish that are trying to get past them. These might, our dams might as well look like this because they cannot get past them. So uh, why did we build so many dams uh, originally? They were built to power grist mills. That's the, that's the, the uh, structure at Hards Lake in South Haven County Park. Uh, cranberry bog production. There, at a time, there was cranberry production on Long Island. Places like the, um, the San Susi system where all those, you see all those uh, little impoundments. That was cranberry bog production. And then ice harvesting. Uh, I gave this uh, sort of an introduction to this issue to some high school students this week. And, they're not even old enough to remember people who had stories of the days before refrigerators, so they had no idea what I was talking about when I said ice harvesting. But obviously, we before electronic refrigeration, you know, we we harvested ice. We impounded tributaries so we could uh, wait till they froze and, and chop up the ice and put it in the ground to use all year round. And I I say our dams were. Impound, our, our tributaries have been impounded or dammed, and I, I don't want to leave you the impression that there's a single dam on these tributaries. Most all of them are dammed multiple times, and some, this is that San Susi system on the Browns River, it's not only common to have five, six, seven, but this is like everywhere you see permanent there is a, is a place where the fish have no chance of getting past. So I think there's 13 permanent barriers on the Browns River for these fish trying to get upstream to their spawning habitat. So how are these fish doing on Long Island? You heard um, about uh, the brook trout from chart. Um, the eels are, you know, the eel population is shrinking on both its southern ends and its uh, northern end t uh, towards Long Island and the mid-Atlantic region. Uh, they're not doing well. River herring are, are not doing well ac across their range, although there's some pockets where, uh, in like places like Maine, where they're restoring rivers, they're starting to, to rebound a bit. Um, River herring were, are listed as a species of concern federally, and they were, uh, peti there was a petition in 2011 by NRDC to list them as in uh, on the endangered species list. Uh, it was denied in 2013, but not because anybody was convinced that they were doing well, largely because the data was found to be insufficient. And so um, NIMS provided some funding for the uh, experts to go back out and really try to assess their coastal population. Uh, that process is sort of uh, happening now, there was a court order last year to sort of push them forward on that study um, and, and try to get a, a sense of how these fish are doing on a coastal scale. But I like to remind people that regardless of how they're doing coastally, they might you know, they'd be doing great up in New England and up towards Canada, but if they're not coming back to Long Island's rivers, they're not coming into our estuaries, it doesn't, that, they're not, they're, that population's not able to help us. So it's, uh, it's imperative that we uh, 
are involved in not just helping these fish on a coastal scale, but on our local scale, so these fish are coming back to Long Island. Um, and then, how are they doing across the island? This is, this is the easy way to sort of tell you is that they're, of all the tributaries on this island, 140 or so that we've been able to identify in Nassau and Suffolk, uh, there's really one tributary that we know of that has an uninterrupted run of river herring, one. And um, it's out in North Sea, it's uh, Alewife Creek that drains out of Big Fresh Pond uh, down to North Sea Harbor. There's two road crossings across this bridge and the culverts are both of concern. They, they impede the fish at certain, the, at certain tides and, and at low flows, but there's never been a dam built on this stream, so there's never been a permanent barrier. And this run was estimated uh, a couple years ago at about, at about 100,000 fish, of 100,000 fish coming in um, to Big Fresh Pond to spawn every year. But every other tributary uh, has been dammed and is, the, these runs have been impacted. And I, you know, people say, well, what's the big deal? What about, who cares about these foot-long fish and you know, nobody really eats them and they're not that uh, exciting. Um, it's not just the fish, it's the role they're playing in our, in our coastal ecosystem. So as these fish and are, are moving out of the ocean at this time of year in, into our estuaries um, and then running up the rivers, they're transferring all that ocean energy upstream. And along the way, they're providing forage for countless species. And providing forage at a time that's really critical because it's very early in the season, at a time when many other species have either just made it through a cold winter or have finished their own migrations and are preparing for their own uh, breeding seasons and need that energy to get ready. Uh, one, you know, one great example, of course, is osprey. Osprey, the birders will tell you, come back to Long Island uh, uh, for St. Patrick's Day. And, they're, and they've just, I've seen my first photos. I haven't seen one yet, but I've seen photos this week. They're back. Uh, it's precisely the time that the river herring are back. And it's not by coincidence that their, mi their northerly migration is, uh, coincides with the river herring because a lot of the other fish that they rely on, bunker and uh, other fish are not, either not around yet or not active enough to, for them to, to be feeding on them. So they take advantage of the river herring. And I, those predators that I showed you here, these are mostly uh, predators feeding on adult river herring and adult eels, but you think about a, 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 an adult river herring lays up to a quarter million eggs. The survival rate of, that, of those eggs is less than 1%. So you can all of those eggs, all that ocean energy distributed in our streams for all, other, all these other species to feed on. And then those, those, uh, those eggs hatch, they're like, perfect little bite-sized morsels for countless other species to feed on. And then the eels, the eels are coming in also this time of year, and they're coming in as glass eels from the ocean. And again, what a perfect bite-sized morsel for, for you know, countless species. And th these are coming now. I was at a South Shore uh, spillway on Tuesday, and I was amazed to see glass eels by the hundreds uh, uh, clamoring to get up the dam. And you know, there is this notion that that eels can, can climb and scale walls, so we don't really need to worry about them because they're fine. They're like Spider-Man, they just go up the wall. Um, in the spillway where I was watching on Tuesday, there were probably just three or 400 glass eels congregated at the base of the dam. There were maybe a dozen on each side in the corners, sort of stuck trying to make their way up, and I saw one eel up over the first step of the spillway that was about a foot high had made its way up to, onto the slope of the spillway. So it's, you know, they're, they're capable of doing it, but not, ma not many of them make it, and it certainly significantly cuts down uh, their successful migration rate. So what are we doing about it? Um, about 10 years ago, there was a coalition formed called the Long Island DFWG. You guys, you've heard this, of course, right? The, the Diadromous Fish Work Group. Now you know what this means. Uh, it's a, a sort of a loose organization of um, NGOs. It was really started by the Environmental Defense Fund when they were more engaged on Long Island and uh, involves, oh, that's overlapping, sorry, but uh, also the South Shore Estuary Reserve Office was involved. I've probably missed some here, but we meet two or three times a year. We talk about some of the projects around the island. Uh, it's open 
to other organizations. We're always welcome people to, um, to get involved. It's a great group. We have good discussions, a nice barbecue every summer. It was fun. And we're focused on these dams and what, you know, trying to figure out ways to get fish past these barriers and rebound and help their populations rebound. Um, this is one way to do it is with fish pass. This is the first permanently installed fish passage on Long Island uh, on the Carmen's River. The great story about this fishway is that the, the day that they were finishing it, literally bolting it to the wall and taking out the boards uh, around this time of year, the river herring that were congregated in, this, in the tidal section here um, almost immediately started going up the ladder. They, they sense that flow and they respond right away. So it's a, you know, if you build it, they will come, it seems. Uh, this is Grangeville Park in Riverhead. I don't, every, I don't know about you guys, but my only reference in Riverhead is the Peconic Paddler. So it's Peconic Paddler down here in the bottom. Uh, Grangeville Park had two spillways. Uh, this is a photo looking down from what was the, the south spillway. That spillway uh, looking up, this is what it this used to be an impounded section of the, of the river there. In 2008, they started dewatering this took the water out, and then built what's called a rock ramp. This is a nature-like fishway, and this was completed in 2009. So where there used to be a spillway there at the, at the bridge, now, the, now there's this nice ramp. The fish can navigate that. They're very, uh, very capable swimmers. They can't jump, but they can very high burst rates, and they can swim through those sort of um, rapids. So this run has been expanding. Uh, we, we had a video system there in 2011. We counted... 17,000 fish um, alewives, and, and, we, and we had lots of technical trouble, so we probably missed half of them. Uh, Byron Young is estimating this run now over 50,000 fish, so uh, they're, they're doing well. This is you know, one of the now largest runs on the island. Um, so another thing that the work the DFWG has done is organized what we call the volunteer uh, alewife survey, although we're now, I'm sort of trying to change that now to the, the volunteer river herring survey because of the, you know, the, diff, the, the, the confirmation that blueback herring, uh, herring are here as well. Um, this, is a vol this is a citizen science project. We, I, we conducted five trainings with the last one last night uh, over the past couple weeks, uh, getting volunteers out across the island looking for these fish. Uh, we are aware of other locations where they exist. So these are the big two I mentioned, Alewife Creek and the Peconic River. Um, those are, they're in their own category because they're the largest, far and away. But we have fish now in the Carmen's River, Massapequa Creek, uh, Sunken Meadow Creek, uh, the, the Carl's River, the Mill River in, in Nassau County, and, and, and many more. We're up to 22, uh, 21 locations where the fish exist. This is one we found just last year. I know it's a blurry picture, but the Mill River, if you know, in, uh, the Mill River is the river that runs through Hempstead Lake State Park. And it runs down through Rockville Center at this point where uh, Sunrise Highway meets Merrick Road and the Long Island Railroad, right? I have a pointer here, right, right here. Sunrise, Merrick Road, and the railroad. Um, we found fish last year, I say we, one of our volunteers found fish last year, in the spillway at Smith Pond. They, they migrated under this complex uh, almost 700 feet, and we're, we were unable to find any evidence of a, of a longer underground migration on Long Island, I mean on, on the East Coast. We, we t consulted with the Fish and Wildlife Service, they knew of a place where they maybe went 400 feet. Um, all the, every expert we talked to said there's, there's no way they're going to go underground that far. Uh, but these are, you know, their drive to, uh, to spawn, their drive to get upstream is very strong. And, uh, you know, I find it sort of uh, yeah, inspirational that these fish will keep going. And, you know, there, I tell people that there's lots of things to be uh, frustrated and um, about in, in the environment and not, not very hopeful about. But this is, this is not one of those stories. This is, this is a, a species. These fish are so... Um, driven to get upstream and so resilient that they've put up with so much for the past few centuries, if we can open up this habitat, they will respond. These numbers will rebuild. I mean, this is arguably the most mistreated tributary of Long Island. It's been impounded 
over and over again. It's been severely channelized and, and it's hardened all the way down to the, to, the, to the bay, and yet these fish are still coming back. They can't get to the habitat they want to get to, the, fresh, the nice, fresh, cool water, but they're spawning in, brac in a brackish system, very suboptimal spawning conditions. So their, their success rate is dropping, and their population probably keeps dwindling, but it's, they're not gone yet. So we're still finding these remnant runs. Uh, we trained 49 people at a, at a training last night to go out and find some more. Uh, we, I mentioned we're, there's 21 places where we know they exist. There's 140 plus tributaries. We think there's a lot more of them out there. Oh, there's that culvert. Um, which brings me to our, our sort of next phase of this, and this is our, our Long Island River Revival Project. SeaTuck spearheading this, but we worked very carefully with the Peconic Estuary Program and the, uh, the Long Island Sound Study in pulling this together. And I'm going to try to switch, if I can make this work. I want to show you, I want to show you this map and, and show you how it, how it works. So you get to, this is hosted on our website at ctuck.org, but we have mapped uh, every tributary in Nassau and Suffolk County, and you can zoom in here, and um, we've color-coded it. So the, the green sections are the, are the portions of the tributaries where the fish have access. It doesn't mean there's fish there, but it means there's nothing blocking their access. The red sections are places where they can't get to. There's some dam or other barrier in their way. Uh, the places where some restoration has already happened, like at Hards, at Hards Lake, are, are in blue. So that's where they have new, newly restored access. Um, the places where you see the fish icons are where we know fish exist. It doesn't mean there's big, strong, healthy runs there. It means one, at one time over the past 12 years that we've been running the survey, somebody has seen and we've confirmed uh, river herring in, the, in that system. The stars identify re, uh, reconnectivity projects, so fish passage projects or dam removal projects, and either they're either existing, they're in the works, they're being pl or planned, or they're proposed. And they're, they're different colors. They're the purple ones are, are projects that we have worked together with the, with the estuary programs to prioritize, that the places we think uh, are the most realistic uh, places where these river herring runs can rebound uh, and, and places where we, we're, we're going to push elected officials and municipal leaders to advance these uh, restoration projects. Uh, you, and you can get on this, if you get into this map, we encourage you to explore the map, but you can click on these different sections, it gives you information about the, the system and, and what, when it was surveyed and what sort of access is there. Back to, does that work? That worked. Nice. High tech here. It's good to have scientists at BNL make all this stuff work. It's nice. So I mentioned the map. Every tributary we've been able, every tributary that has an actual freshwater connection. So you'll find some lagoons and other sections that aren't identified. Um, and that's the, the reason is because there's no freshwater uh, habitat of, of potentially available. And um, it tells you where it's accessible, where the projects are, and where the priority projects are. And I, I should point out, this is a work in progress, and we were careful to get everything and be as, as thorough as we could. But I, you know, I had one a missing tributary pointed out to me last night. So we're, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot, other, a lot of other mistakes. I, I hope you guys will take a look at it and tell us uh, how we can fix it. And then the, um, the, I mentioned the piece that goes with the map is the strategy. So this is a, this is a document that's on our website. We've, as I said, worked with the estuary programs to identify these places where we think the restoration's uh, attention needs to focus. And it provides lots of, you know, with the idea that we're going to print these and hand them out to elected officials and other uh, municipal officials. And it gives background on, on the fish, uh, ideas about where they can find more information, and then identifies, in every town, we've identified two or three or four priority sites. And, and recommended what sort of actions we think should happen there. 
Which brings me to this picture, which is something of, which is a picture from Connecticut, but one I'm, I'm hoping, as, as Chart mentioned, we'll, we'll see on Long Island before too long. Uh, our restoration plan identifies uh, some, some goals for the populations of migratory fish. We tried to, over 10 years, take the numbers of river herring to 1.5 million. That's not going to happen with fish ladders. Uh, we have to start addressing the, the elephant in the room, which are the dams. I mentioned that we, we built these dams to uh, power grist mills, harvest ice, run cranberry bogs. We don't need any, we don't need any of those th uh, things anymore. Some, some impoundments were created for recreational purposes or aesthetic purposes, but um, generally not. And you know, they are and certainly in some cases still serving those roles. People are fishing and boating on them. Uh, in some places they're very ingrained part of the communities, like Think about Argyle Lake in Babylon. I mean, that's a, an impoundment. The, the, the facade for the dam is part of the, the logo for the village. I mean, it's a very big part of the community. Not every dam on Long Island is a good candidate for dam removal, but uh, on the other hand, not every dam needs to stay. And we're attached to these dams, but I'd like to point out that these dams are not free. There's a cost to these dams. The dams themselves need maintenance on a regular basis. And then as all impoundments do, these impoundments are behind the dams are silting in. As they get more shallow, uh, they of course grow more aquatic vegetation. And this becomes an issue now because now uh, as they silt in with invasive and non-invasive species, um, municipalities are having to deal with trying to keep them clear. The town of Brookhaven spent $4 million clearing uh, aquatic vegetation at upper lakes. And they're gonna, try, they're gonna spend another $4 million at lower lake. Um, this is a coming attraction across Long Island, and municipalities are going to have to figure out how to deal with this. And uh, if you remove the dam, you don't have to worry about it. You have no invasive species. And then Chart mentioned the brook trout. I want to just touch on this quickly. Um, the dams, as Chart said, are a problem. Even, even if you get a fish ladder into a dam and, and get access restored for migratory uh, river herring. The, the impoundment itself is a problem still because it's heating, it's heating up. It's, it's, it's a heat sink. It's sitting there baking in the sun all day and it becomes a, it becomes a thermal barrier itself. So migratory fish like brook trout are not going to swim through an 80 degree pond to go out to the estuary. They're going to turn around and go back upstream. Or if they're coming in from the estuary, they're not going to move through that impoundment. And then the other issue is that the impoundments are dumping warm water downstream, which is reducing the quality of the habitat downstream, especially for brook trout. And this is a, a, an example, Southerns Pond on the Carls River, uh, Trout Unlimited, the Long Island chapter, Trout Unlimited did seven years of, of temperature data, and we pulled this together into some charts, but we, they did lots of points on the river. Uh, we took the data from the, the point closest to the north side of Southerns Pond and right in the spillway of Southerns Pond. So this is the upstream, this is four years worth on average on the upstream side. You can see it, it's peaking up above, this is the 75 degree mark, which is, is getting too warm for brook trout already, but it's, it's still okay, it's still down generally below 70 degrees. This is the downstream gauge, at the, at the gauging station, the downstream temperatures. And you can see it's spiking up over 80 degrees for most of the summer. So this is the run of the year from May to September. Um, and so we average, th that's the 75 degree line again. You average these lines, this is what they look like for those four years. Um, on average, 10 degrees, 10 degree difference between the top of that pond and the bottom of that pond. So the pond itself is too hot. And uh, I presented this temperature to the mayor of uh, Babylon Village. And he said, well, it probably cools right back down because the rest of the stream down to the bay is, is groundwater fed. And, it, and I, I said, yeah, you're probably right about that, but let me get the data and we'll, and we'll, we'll find out. And you know, he was right, the temperature does drop in the course of the mile it runs to the bay, but it drops about a degree. So uh, the lines for the, all the gauging stations below the pond basically follow that red line. They're just slightly off. So, it cools, but not enough to, to matter. These impoundments are having uh, significant thermal impacts on our tributaries. 
So um, this is sort of the, the sort of take home pieces. How can you guys get involved? I, you know, we encourage everybody to explore that map. I mean, you, this, this crowd, of course, you guys are already familiar with lots of Long Island tributaries. And, but as we, as we go out and talk to more people, we're gonna encourage the public to get to know tributaries in their own neighborhoods. You know, it's amazing to me still, people have no idea how many tributaries exist or even that the, these places that are impounded are rivers or streams. I had a, I stood in a guy's backyard once and, and at, at the edge of the, the pond, the lake behind his house, and I told him it was a river that was impounded. He looked at me like I, I had two heads. He said, no, that's, that's a, a pond. It's always been a pond. My, you know, my wife's grandmother ice skated on that pond. It's a pond. It's not. <laughs> um, these, the fish icons, if you look at the map, these are places you can, you can we know that the fish are there. Sometimes it's not that many, but you can find them there. Uh, we would love to get you involved in the survey. It started now. It runs from May, uh, March 15th to May 15th, and we're looking for these fish. As I said, there's lots of places where we think we can still find them, and in places where we know they exist, there's more information to find about the timing of their run, the size of the run, and the upstream progress. So in the Carls River, for example, we know fish are going past the, the fish ladder into Argyle Lake but we have no evidence that they're in Argyle Lake or anywhere further up where they have access. So uh, we're, we're trying to get better information about how far, how far these fish are moving uh, once they go past these um, barriers. And then the purple stars, the priority sites. I mean, we, we want to try to move these projects forward. We need local champions. I mean, CTEC's going to be involved. Uh, the DFWG is going to be involved. The, the, the estuary programs, we have a champion in, in Chart Guthrie at the state, but we need, we need local people to push elected officials. And you know, the first thing they're all going to say to you is that they, they're worried about the neighbors who live near the pond or the people who fish there or the people who go ice skating there. Uh, they need to hear from constituents who care about uh, the health of the river and the health of the broader ecosystem. These, are, these dams are having an impact, as I mentioned, economically. We're all paying for them and ecologically because they're, they're, um, they're keeping uh, our tributaries from the role that they're supposed to be playing in our coastal ecosystem. Uh, that map is available at our website, if you, that's ctuck.org. We're going to leave that Long Island River revival project on the top banner. So if you click on that, it takes you to the map. There's actually two portals to the map. One takes you directly to the map. The other is what's called the story map. And, it, and for people, you know, if you're friends or family who don't know the story of, of migratory fish, it kind of walks you through that story first before taking you into the map. So uh, I encourage you to check that out. Um, and then as a sort of shifting gears, the last thing that the, the organizers gave me an opportunity to mention is that about a year ago, we launched this website called um, longislandfieldnotes.org. And this, we used to have a paper newsletter at SeaTuck where we had some nice nature writing. We actually have a, a, a group called the Center for Nature Writing at SeaTuck that meets once a month. And so we had, we had a, a lot of nice stories being written. We wanted a place to put them once we got rid of the newsletter. So this is where, where that's happening. Um, there's a, we try to have seasonal stories there. Uh, John Turner, this is a piece that John Tur Turner wrote most recently. Uh, Steve Turr, Sue Avery. But we, we, need, we, 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 want, we want this to be bigger. We want more people to, to write for it. Um, we're, there's only four or five of us at the moment. Um, so if you're, if you're a writer, I know some of you are, we'd love su um, submissions from you to get onto the website and, uh, and, and spread the word about it. If I could open this up, let's see if I can do this again. Oh, I don't have a key pad here. Well, I was going to show you some of the, the, the great stories on here. It's not just writing. It's also we have some nice photo essays and uh, video stories as well. So I encourage you to check it out. And um, if you're a writer, send us, send us your stories. All right. Thank you. We do have uh, time for questions. Uh, have you checked out, my name is Daniel Carpin, have you checked out a stream roughly on the Huntington-Smithtown border called Fort Pond, I believe, that runs into Long Island Sound? 
I know that a friend of mine 20 years ago or 25 years ago said there were, quote, our wives running into that. It's on the North Shore. Well, if I, I have a couple minutes, we could just, we yeah, can Pol just do this. Go we'll do it right the now. North Shore, uh, be Smithtown border, uh, just west, west of Sunken Meadow State Park. No, the other way. Sunken Meadow State Park. Go to the west of Sunken Meadow State Park. Oh, go about, this is about Sunken Meadow. West, right there, right there. Those, what do they indicate? Fresh Pond Creek. Yes. Any fish in there? We have evidence of fish there. That's good. Well, at least. Um, <laughs> but that, I don't, that, I mean, this is not what I know. I think we probably have a record from sometime over the past couple of years. It's not accessible, so they're probably, you know, these, these North Shore systems are interesting in some places because the access uh, closes and opens depending on the, the, the state of the, the flow and the beach. And so sometimes these fish gather there right on the beach and they try to find a way to go upstream. So Fresh Pond in Fort Salonga is like this. We have, yes. we have fish there. Um, they're short systems generally, but they're, you know, they're good, good spawning habitat for alewives certainly. So, so I'm glad that um, what, what uh, I knew 20 or 25 years ago has been documented. Thanks. All right. Uh, yes, Crab Meadow. It's green, I mean, it's accessible. There's no dams there, but it's mostly tidal, uh, except for these little pieces at the top. So uh, we don't know that there's any really good freshwater habitat there. Um, there's a little impoundment here at this end crab, in Crab Meadow, but we don't know. They could be, they could be there. But you notice you get the same know-it-alls when it comes to fish. Uh, I guess we have a history of fishing. Uh, an interesting thing about alewife is that uh, you wouldn't think of them as uh, game fish uh, when they're on their spawning run, but uh, immediately after they finish spawning, when they're still in the lakes, they can actually be pretty uh, fun to fish for. But I think the real point that I want to get to is the location that I did that was a place called Doxy Pond in North Woodmere, the Five Towns area. And I did have a chance to look at the interactive map online, and it did not indicate that there was a known spawning run. Now again, this goes back to the 80s, but I have no reason to think they wouldn't still be there. Yeah, well, it's worth checking. I, I mean, I don't, I recognize the name. I don't know that we've had surveyors there. And, you know, our surveys have been, you know, we have a lot of really interested people who go out uh, and, you know, the, the, I would hate to say it's a needle in a haystack, but in some cases it's a needle in a haystack because you're talking about, you know, a, a few dozen or a few hundred fish coming into a system and, you know, they're pulsing in and out. The conditions are going to change. For you to be there to see these fish when they're there, you know, it's, it's chances are small. So our volunteers go out, they get, you know, they get frustrated because they don't see anything. Their interest wanes, they're, you know, and so... It's, it's possible that this is a system that just hasn't been looked at carefully. That's probably it. Uh, I mean, when I was going there, you know, you'd see them when they were coming in. Uh, you would see when the young were going out. They were in big, uh, you know, schools near the uh, spillway, ready, getting ready to leave. So they were doing quite well breeding-wise there. And hopefully they well, still are, but, you know, it's a yeah. site that ought to be checked. Well, to, I'll, I'll spread the word. It's a good one to check. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you.